Um, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's now joining. Um, we'll be starting in a few minutes when, we've, when most people have come in. Okay. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's now joining. Um, we'll be Just a few more minutes and then we will start. Two minutes, make sure people can join in time. Okay, uh, I would now like to kick off. Uh, thank you everyone for attending the Eurofa State of the EU Steel Market webinar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by Alessandro Schiamarelli, who is our Director of, uh, of Economic and Market Analysis and who authors these quarterly reports that Eurofa puts out on the State of the EU Steel Market. Today we will be looking at the steel market up to and including the second quarter of 2020 with some analysis of the third quarter. As you are all no doubt aware, uh, the state of the EU market is a difficult one. Uh, COVID, the effect of COVID has compounded what was already a difficult situation in 2019 uh, with production cuts, uh, job losses, closures of plants being announced almost daily. This is obviously a very difficult situation and therefore is one that needs to be handled with care. Um, we as Eurofair are working very hard to try and make sure that our position is heard relative to the ongoing challenges that we are facing as a European industry. Uh, European steel is a strategic sector at the heart of the EU economy and therefore its struggle presents a significant challenge for, for both us mm -hmm. and our downstream uh, users. Um, and, and, and as such, we uh, rely on, um, we rely on EU policymakers and on users who consider our position. Now, this uh, webinar will consist of largely two parts. It will be Alessandro Schiamarelli, Director of Economic and Market Analysis, giving a presentation on the report uh, that he has just authored, and which will be out later today and available to attendees of this meeting. Uh, that will take about 20 minutes, followed by a question and answer session, which you can use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I look forward to having a fruitful discussion with you all today. And if you have any follow-up questions afterwards, um, I hope to be able to address them with you later. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Alessandro, who will present the report. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, Alessandro, please. Thank you very much, Aris, for your um, kind uh, <clears throat> introduction. And, um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Charles said, I'm Director of Economic Research and Market Analysis at Eurofer. Eurofer is the European association which groups uh, national still producers, associations, and also indi major individual steel companies in Europe. And we produce on a regular basis our <clears throat> quarterly 
uh, economic uh, and market outlook, which uh, um, reports and makes available latest actual figures on uh, state indicators, uh, imports, consumption, and so on. And also tries to provide a, an overview of a possible outlook and possible uh, developments for the sector and with um, comprehensive um, uh, forecast for, for, for a two year span, so which means 2020 and 2021. Our latest report um, um, is, is ready and the presentation of today will very much reflect the key findings and the key uh, and the key figures that are contained in the report. So uh, basically uh, the presentation will be structured along, uh, along these sections, uh, which are, first of all, um, an overview of the macroeconomic conditions and obviously which are hugely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and its outbreak, which has been widespread across uh, European economies and advanced economies since mid-March this year, and is having still uh, a, a huge impact on, 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 uh, on industrial activity and the economic activity, uh, particularly in the light of a recent rise in recent weeks uh, uh, of infections across Europe, which is already casting a shadow uh, on the fourth quarter of this year. Then we will have an overview of still using centers in their developments and forecasts for, for, for the next two years. And then we will go through uh, steel market indicators, consumption, imports, and et cetera. So we will have a, a short focus on trade, um, on some trade aspects. And, uh, and also we will uh, shed some information, set, shed some light on the, let's say more short-term impact of COVID-19 on the steel sector on the basis of the monitoring activity that we are we've been carrying out uh, since the start of the outbreak on the impact on the sector. And then we will try to draw some conclusions based on the content of the report and also try to, we will try to uh, give some, uh, some possible, uh, some possible um, findings for, for, for future, for the future of, of the sector over the, over the next two years. So, uh, the economic outlook obviously is very much has been hugely impacted by the by the outbreak of a pandemic and confidence indicators which are reported here um, very much reflect the the impact of, of the pandemic on, on the on the overall economy and on the industrial economy. On the left hand side, you see the economic sentiment indicator, and on the right hand side, the industrial confidence indicators, both provided by the European Commission. And the data very much signal um, confidence plummeting since Ma mid March this year as a result uh, of, a, of, a, of a pandemic, uh, with a, a strong rebound uh, further to the removal of lockdown measures across member states, which have led to a restart in industrial activity. So the rebound has been considerable in June and July, but then it has eased somewhat in August. Uh, and uh, we expect an October data for economic and industrial confidence will show some uh, considerable slowdown and uh, even more, more likely a decline in confidence due to the uh, rise of this, the new wave in infections that has been observed in recent weeks all, all over Europe. Uh, interestingly, another um, major leading indicator, which is not reported in the slide, which is the IHS market PMI composite indicators that a lot, a lot of, of uh, many of you are very familiar with. Uh, it's a very important leading indicator for industrial activity and uh, uh, it signals a, a strong rebound equally in, in June and July uh, this year after the removal of lockdown measures. But uh, it, again, in, in, in September, it showed some slowdown considered with a two speed picture uh, primarily, the, 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 the recovery in confidence seems to be driven primarily by industry, in particular in Germany. So the industry seems to be better placed than other uh, economic sectors, particularly uh, services that have been most impacted by the pandemic. Um, service, the service sector appears to be rather fragile and, and, and weak. Uh, so the recovery is very much driven um, in, in these times by, by, by a recovery in, in the industry, provided that it's still very fragile and subject to downside risks linked to the new rise in, in, in infection. But the, 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 the manufacturing uh, market PMI indicator has risen considerably since the rebound uh, after the removal of lockdown measures. But as a result of a pandemic, obviously GDP growth, if it comes to national accounts data to, to actual GDP growth in the EU, uh, GDP growth has uh, 
has, has plummeted, has, uh, has become hugely negative. It was already negative in Q1, which was only partly affected by the pandemic and, and the lock and the economic lockdown. But as you can see, economic growth had been slowing down already since uh, at least the second half of, of 2018, when the economic cycle started to slow down. Uh, whereas the, the previous economic cycle in 2017 and 2018 had been almost moving. So in Q2, uh, a fall of 14% in GDP. And uh, for, for this year, uh, the picture is very much affected by Q2 data, which appears to be uh, an unprecedented fall in GDP, um, the, the harshest the GDP fall on record. And this is very much likely to affect the whole, fi the whole GDP figure for 2020. Here we report the, the latest quarter on quarter figure for Q2. In, uh, in major euro economies and also for the US. And then we, uh, on, on, the, on the right hand side of the slide, we report the latest available um, macroeconomic forecast by major forecasters, including Eurofair at the very, at the very um, end right of, of, of the slide. Uh, so as you can see, uh, we had unprecedented quarterly GDP falls uh, in, in Germany, France, Italy, in the, in the EU, all, um, all above, uh, 20, uh, all above 10%, uh, except for Germany, is likely below 10%. Uh, then, interestingly, the latest uh, IMF forecast for 2020 have revised, uh, have revised uh, for US uh, their growth predictions, and the US seems to be better placed than other European economies, with a fall of 4.3% 4, 4 of GDP in 2020. But then, uh, and also Germany within the euro area seems to be uh, the best positioned um, European country uh, in terms of the um, magnitude of the recession uh, caused by the pandemic, whereas uh, France will almost have a 10% uh, GDP recession and Italy almost 11 minus 11% GDP recession. Um, and um, but nevertheless, uh, these latest IMF forecasts appear to be slightly less pessimistic than uh, the European Commission forecasts, which were released in August. Uh, the European Commission uh, summer forecasts were still very much affected by the, uh, let's say, the very recent effects of the lockdown in, 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 uh, in uh, April, May, and also partly in June, whereas the, uh, the IMF forecast reflected some improvement in the economic activity and confidence indicators throughout the summer. Um, but then, as I said, the fourth quarter of, of this year uh, appears to be very much influenced by the the new rise in, in, in infections, um, which uh, is already being widespread across Europe. And so as Eurofair, we have uh, produced our um, GDP forecast uh, for euro area economies as you, and for the EU. As you, as you see, uh, Germany is supposed to um, experience a relatively um, lower recession, minus 6%, France and Italy uh, 9%, which is anyway an unprecedented um, recession in, 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 in major European economies. Um, we go to you still using sectors and uh, um, obviously the pandemic has uh, worsened dramatically the uh, declining trend which had already been observed in previous quarters uh, um, at least um, since the uh, second half of 2018 as for the uh, as for the economic general economic cycle. So we see the real output in, in the major still using sectors construction, mechanical engineering, and automotive, which are the three most important steel using sectors. Uh, steel using sectors are extremely important for, for the steel industry because they are actually our end users. Uh, and, and these are the, 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 say the, mar the market operators which use our products and demand our products. Uh, so you see uh, the year and year increase in, in, in real output in these sectors and you see uh, the declining trend uh, over the last few quarters, uh, and then uh, um, automotive has already been experiencing uh, a dramatic fall, uh, a considerable fall in output since at least uh, um, Q3 18, and then throughout the 20, 2019, uh, recording the worst performances compared to other um, to other uh, steel using sectors, whereas construction has proven more resilient. Than, than other serious sectors. And this has resulted in a, in a negative growth rate only in, uh, in Q2 in this year, um, as a result also of the pandemic. And the pandemic has clearly uh, dramatically worsened the picture. Uh, 
that and has led uh, ultimately in uh, uh, double digit falls in automotive almost 45% but also mechanical engineering and, and, and total sweep have recorded have recorded considerable falls in 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 in, in output uh, sweep is, a, is still weighted uh, industrial production which is uh, um, the the industrial production which is weighted with uh, the, the the impact of, of still using sectors um, q2 however is as I've said before, is expected to be the trough, the lowest point of the cycle. And we expect Q3 to Q3 data once they will be available to already show a rebound and improvement. But this is very much at risk in terms of continuity and way back to full recovery because Q4 data are expected to be very much affected by the pandemic. And then you see other leading indicators for the industry and for major stages of sectors on the, on the left-hand side, you see the the order books, uh, um, the balance of order books, uh, and, and uh, for for major steel using sectors, and also including uh, metal goods, which is the red line with the uh, dramatically um, uh, negative rates uh, in uh, since uh, early 2019, uh, late 2018, uh, early 2019. Um, plummeting really down to double digit growth rates, uh, even below 40% for metal goods and also for motor vehicles in, in March this year as a result of the, of the, of the industrial lockdown. Um, and then on, on, the, on the left hand side and on the right hand side, you see uh, Eurostat's um, figures for industrial production up to Q2 this year. Uh, year, year growth rates have uh, um, been constantly negative. Uh, over the last three quarters, except for Spain, which reported a slightly positive increase in Q4. Uh, but then uh, they've already uh, fallen um, almost by 10% in, in major individual uh, euro area countries, Spain, Italy, Germany, and France in Q1 this year, as a result of, of, the, um, of the pandemic outbreak in the, in the first quarter. And then they have plummeted to unprecedented um, drops uh, up to 30% in, in, in all individual economies, in, in, including Germany, up to Q2. But then, as I said, we expect Q3 uh, industrial production data to reveal some improvement, um, some considerable rebound uh, due to the restart in industrial activity uh, after the removal of lockdown measures in June. Uh, and this is an overview which I think is, is very much interesting because it allows you to compare uh, actual developments in annual terms, in, in real output, in major um, steel using sectors in the previous uh, big economic crisis, which was the 2009-2010 uh, financial crisis driven uh, recession, let's say. Uh, and then what has happened also, we can see what has happened in the pre-COVID-19 COVID, in the pre -COVID recession in 2019. Uh, as I said, because the economic cycle was already slowing down considerably during, during 2019. Um, and then you can see our, uh, on the right hand side, finally, our uh, latest forecast for CDU sector output in 2020 and 2021. So, um, in a nutshell, um, the construction sector was very much impacted during the financial crisis of, 20, of 2009, primarily because the, the financial crisis started from the construction sector, the housing market collapse in the US uh, was very much a driving factor behind. Uh, where, uh, whereas it is expected to be the least affected sector this time around, it was still it re still recorded positive growth in 2019 by 3.6 percent, and it's expected to be the low, the, the the least impacted uh, steel using sector in 2020. Uh, whereas automotive was already dramatically impacted in 2009, uh, already recorded two consecutive years of recession in 2018 and 2019. In 2019, automotive uh, fell by five percent. And is expected to record its uh, harshest recession uh, ever experienced in 2020 by 20.6%. Uh, uh, the reason why um, the steel using sectors recorded such a weak performance in 2019, and particularly automotive, but as you can see also mechanical engineering and domestic appliances, is mainly because. As you've seen from our previous report, um, the um, global manufacturing picture uh, weakened considerably as a result of many downside factors, namely um, the, the natural end of a previous booming cycle, uh, 2017, 2018, and also 
uh, trade tensions which uh, arose uh, in a global trade environment uh, and also man, um, tensions around uh, the new uh, automotive uh, electric vehicle regulation and uncertainty among producers and, and consumers, which all affected automotive demand in particular. But then the manufacturing cycle entered a, a very serious crisis, which has then culminated in these uh, record falls in Q2, uh, mostly affected also by the pandemic. Um, then, um, as in relation to our latest forecast, as you can see, we, we see forecasts for all major um, CGU sectors in 2020. Total sweep is expected to fall by 10.4%. Uh, construction, as I said, will record the, the least, let's say the lowest, so to say, recession in 2020. Uh, and automotive will, will uh, experience the worst recession. In 2021, we expect a rebound which we have quantified more or less, as you can see. Um, but um, obviously, this, uh, these forecasts are subject to a wide degree of uncertainty and may be revised over the next few quarters as a result of the evolution of the, of the global picture and the, the evolution, uh, most importantly, of the pandemic. Uh, and the, uh, much will depend on, 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 the, on the timing of the recovery and whether recovery will be, uh, will be um, sustained and, and continued uh, in, in early 2021. Uh, then we have a brief overview of, of uh, two stimulus sectors in particular, construction and automotive, mainly because these are the two most important stimulus sectors um, for, for our industry. Construction accounts for roughly 35, 34% of, of steel consumption in Europe. The current situation, as you can see, uh, also from the construction confidence indicator on, on, on the top of the chart, um, the situation has been widely affected by the pandemic, whereas the sector had proven more relatively resilient in, in the past quarters and months. Uh, but then, the, um, obviously, obviously, confidence has collapsed in March and has rebounded as a result of the restarting activity and in construction works. Um, particularly, uh, what is expected to be very important for the next two years, and particularly for 2021, is that uh, a, a considerable support should come from public construction, um, primarily because uh, EU governments are expected to boost public construction works and use them as a counter-cyclical macroeconomic tool to tackle the, the worst effect of the COVID pandemic on the economy. Uh, and then uh, the completion of uh, uh, public construction projects should reach should receive uh, considerable impetus. So construction output will rebound by 5% in 2021, provided that we will have no major economic shocks in 2021 and recovery will continue. Uh, for automotive, the, the picture is even more gloomy, more negative, as we said. Uh, we, have, uh, we report our latest numbers provided by the uh, uh, European Car, Ma Car Makers Association. So we, interestingly, um, on a year-to-date basis in September, uh, the sales of new passenger cars fell by uh, roughly 30%. But interestingly, in the same, in the same month, in, in, in September, year-on-year, year, compared to September last year, there was an increase for the first time by 3.1%, which is a, an encouraging signal. Um, and the same for commercial vehicles. But however, although... Um, dealerships opened again after the removal of lockdown measures across Europe, uh, car demand appears to be extremely weak. Uh, and um, also because um, we, we, as macroeconomic forecasters, we don't expect a, a substantial improvement in household income and therefore um, demand of cars from consumers uh, is expected to remain rather low. Um, at least throughout 2020 and also in early 2021, but depending on the, the speed uh, and the intensity of the economic recovery. But uh, we don't expect car demand to improve substantially over the next few months and, and, and quarters. And so the outlook for 2021 is, is, is uh, very much affected by uh, the pandemic of uh, developments and, and the, the, the extension of this uh, new wave, which we're having these weeks. Um, but uh, for 2020, uh, the, the slump is uh, uh, at least 20% 20, 20 as we said, uh, very much affected by the lockdown in March and April and by very, very depressed 
consumer demand due to loss of income and loss of jobs uh, across Europe. So we will we expect a rebound of 18% in 2021, provided that no major um, no major shocks will uh, additional shocks will occur. And then we we go to quickly to the steel market. Uh, this is an, uh, a slide which I think provides an inter interesting overview of developments of uh, uh, the EU steel market as an industry, as a producer over the last uh, um, over the last eleven years. Uh, at least uh, before it provides you an overview of what has happened between um, before and after the two uh, the two latest uh, um, big economic recession. So before 2008, when we had the first recession, and then before uh, the current recession uh, linked to the pandemic in 2020, crude steel production, um, you see, um, shows a decline, a long-term decline for, for the EU. And actually, we, we have never recovered up to the levels observed before the, the, the crisis of 2008 and 2009. Uh, in, 2000 and in 2019, which is the latest year fully available, we have seen a, a decrease over the previous year of 6% in steel production. And over the whole period, over the period of 20, uh, 2008, 2020, assuming uh, a near to date projection for 2020, uh, the compound average growth rate has been negative by 3.1%. So we, we see a long term decline in, in steel production in Europe. And against this background, uh, we, we see, as, we, as it is reported in our quarterly report, uh, we, we, we see uh, developments in, in demand on the demand side um, uh, over, the last, uh, over the last few quarters. And then you see that reflecting the depressing, depressed steel demand and uh, the, the, the very weak steel using sectors and the very weak manufacturing activity, uh, apparent steel consumption has been recording uh, negative growth rates over the last six quarters. Um, this negative trend has started actually in the first quarter of 2019, but then obviously has worsened considerably, uh, reaching um, negative growth rates above 10% in the, in, the in the fourth quarter of 2019, which was already very much affected by the negative developments in the industrial cycle. Uh, and then uh, this uh, decline in apparent consumption has obviously culminated in the 26% uh, fall in apparent consumption in Q2, which is the latest figure available. Obviously, this uh, record low in, in consumption is very much affected, obviously, uh, by the, um, the, the outbreak of the, of the COVID pandemic and the, the, the lockdown in the, in the industry and, uh, and the, the uh, Disrupt the heavy disruption that the steel industry has suffered from in, 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 the, in the first and the second quarter of this year. Uh, so we also expect that Q2 will represent the lowest point of the cycle, the trough, and then we expect some uh, rebound and some improvement in Q3, which will reflect um, the, uh, the restart in industrial activity and some improvement uh, in, in general economic and industry landscape. Uh, but apparent consumption has indeed um, been falling. Uh, as a result, in annual terms in, in 2019, it fell by 5.3%. Then in the whole 2020, it is expected to fall by 14.6%, which is slightly better than our previous forecast. In our previous report, we had foreseen a, a, a drop of 16.6%. And then it is expected to rebound by 13.1% uh, in 2021. A real consumption equally is expected to fall by almost 12% this year and to rebound by 9.3% next year. Uh, then we have a short focus on, uh, um, some focus on trade, which is interesting um, because uh, imports have also, as you can see from, yeah, from the previous slide, imports have also uh, been falling as a, as a result of very, very weak demand. Um, so imports from third countries into the EU have been falling uh, over the last uh, six quarters. Um, but then um, what is interesting to report is that um, despite these continuous decrease in imports into the EU, the share of uh, imports out of total apparent consumption has remained stable or has even increased slightly. Uh, it was 23.5% uh, in, in, in Q1 and now it's 24% in Q2. So it means that um, out of apparent consumption, 24% in Europe is made up of imports. Um, so uh, we, we also report a split of, um, 
import market shares are the total demand for the two major categories of steel products, flat and long. Uh, so then you can see that in, 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 let's say, in annual terms and also in quarterly terms, the, the market share has remained rather stable or has even increased, particularly for flat products, whereas for long products it has been more volatile um, and um, has remained around 10%, where for, whereas for flat it is higher, it has increased up to 22% in the second quarter of this year. Uh, in, on the left-hand side, you see the absolute volumes of imports of finished steel products and then the and year-on-year the -year change. Uh, in 2018, reflecting very, very uh, positive demand conditions, uh, imports increased by 12%, and then they, they fell by 13% in 2019, reflecting, uh, reflecting very much uh, uh, weak, weak steel demand. Uh, then we expect uh, for the whole um, 2020, uh, based on year-to-date uh, data available from January to August, we expect a fall of uh, roughly 19%, but much will depend on developments over the fourth quarter, uh, which are now unpredictable. Uh, so this, um, these trade data signal that imports remain something very important for, for, for the sector. So provided that we will have some uh, stable and robust um, recovery still demand in, 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 in over the course of 2021. Um, European steel producers will have to cope with uh, increasing uh, import pressure and, 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 uh, and um, import competition, which will be, remain significant. Um, then we'll have a focus lastly on the very short term um, impact on, on the COVID-19 crisis, which is the result of a monitoring activity we've been carrying out together with the European Commission since the start of lockdown measure in March this year. Um, the lockdown of uh, lockdown, uh, the lockdown of, uh, of the industry has uh, and the shutdown uh, in steel news industry between mid-March mid and end of May have led so far to a cut in production by 70% um, year on year. This is the latest date available up to the 22nd of October. So it means that um, because of the pandemic, the, 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 the steel sector has already lost 70% of its production. And equally, uh, orders of flat products uh, have decreased by 17% and orders of long products since, uh, since March this year compared to the same period of, of last year have decreased by 17 and 14 percent respectively. Um, the harshest consequences of the lockdown have so far been in relation to employment. Um, so uh, 28 percent of the workforce is affected by temporary layoffs or reduced working time uh, or part-time and part-time employment. This is an improvement compared to four to three percent in September but it's still quite significant. Um, and at the same time, as I said earlier, we have neighboring regions, um, third countries that are con have continued to increase capacity and stockpiling, uh, even in recent months, despite the pandemic, uh, and anticipating the recovery in steel demand, which may take place at some point in, in, uh, in, in 2021. We are not able yet to say, as I've said before, we're not able yet to, to, to say precisely when the recovery will take place. Um, but uh, we had expected in our previous report that already we might have seen some recovery in steel demand in, in late 2020, but we now this is very much subject to uncertainty due to the recent developments in, in the pandemic. So we, we, we expect that a substantial recovery in steel demand may not happened before uh, Q1, maybe even Q2, 2021. But much will depend on the on the on the speed of the of the industrial recovery and on the stability of the economic background. Um, then, last point, in, which relates to trade, is that the EU state safeguards uh, that were reviewed by the Commission in June this year have, in our view, not been adjusted properly to reflect the changes in the market, also in the light of the pandemic developments, so that. Uh, the um, the use steel industry will be subject to potential very very tough competition um, by third countries once uh, uh, demand will pick up and um, because the market penetration of imports remains uh, as I said high in historical terms so 
we we will have to face competition again from imports once demand will pick up. Um, to recap, key findings uh, of this presentation, which are also included more in detail in the report. Uh, as you can see, you and Western economies should have now bottomed out uh, in Q3 after the harshest point of the cycle in Q2. Uh, but the latest confidence indicators, however, um, reveal that recovery is very slow and uncertain and subject to wide and, and widespread uncertainty factors. Uh, rebound is expected in Q3 in, uh, in the industry and the, in the economy, but clouds on the horizon on the, on the horizon again in Q4 because the pandemic is back, uh, as you know. Uh, so the latest numbers are very worrying and we, we are afraid that it might, that it might lead to uh, another considerable slowdown in, in, in industrial activity. On the other hand, we've seen in, in the last few months and uh, we see today still uh, a negotiation going on um, in relation to the unprecedented public support to the European economy that has been put in place, next generation EU package, and also particularly the ECB's um, purchase program, um, the, the purchase of, of government and, corpor and corporate bonds <clears throat> by the ECB. Uh, and so both actions are extremely important, but also uh, although this theoretically uh, is equal to an amount of resources, which is even bigger than the Marshall Plan, uh, which was approved after the Second World War, um, this is still subject to uncertainty because it's still under political negotiation. And also this public support will, uh, will come at a price of a considerable increase in public debt uh, for, for the EU as a whole, which will be a problem at some point. Um, the steel using sectors are, have been uh, impacted at an unprecedented extent uh, because of the pandemic disruption. Um, so they have recorded the worst drop on output in re on record in Q2. Uh, but as I said, for, as for the economy, the trough of the cycle should already be behind. So we expect a rebound in Q3, albeit very uncertain construction, relatively less impacted than the others. Automotive will be the most impacted with a falling output above uh, 20%. Recovery not expected before uh, 2021, possibly uh, in Q1 or maybe even in Q2. Uh, but still, we have so many unpredictable downside risks uh, on the horizon, uh, which makes it very difficult to um, set a precise, uh, let's say, a precise timing for the full recovery of the economy and the industry. And as a result, steel demand will uh, experience record lows in 2020 due to the stop in industrial activity in Q2 and is set to recover uh, only in 2021 due to the very slow recovery which is taking place, which is subject to, as I said, a lot of uncertainty. And the share of imports out of steel demands, uh, despite the fall in imports have remained uh, high in historical terms, so imports are still important uh, and uh, have a considerable share in, out of, uh, of steel demand. Um, so this is everything and uh, I hope we will um, see and, and, uh, and, and read more in detail our report. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, I will now uh, open the floor to uh, questions, you can use the Q&A feature, which should be at the bottom of your screen, to pose them, and I will then subsequently read them out, and either I or more likely Alessandro will attempt to answer them satisfactorily. So I will read them out now. Uh, this question comes from Justin Beckeras. Uh, Construction activity is expected to decrease by 4% in 2020, and at the same time, orders for long steel has fallen by 14% in the period since March. Does it mean we are seeing a recovery for long steels in the fourth quarter of 2020, based on the fact that long steels are almost entirely driven by construction? Um, it's not easy to say. Uh, we, we, as uh, all of you in the audience are aware, we, we, never, we never produce um, steel consumption forecasts split by um, flat and long products. Um, however, as I said, uh, construction activity is expected to decrease by 4%. Uh, and um, 
yes, the long products are mainly used for, for construction, not only for construction, but the problem is that our forecast is subject to um, a wide uncertainty and uh, potential revision, uh, depending very much on what is going to happen in the, in the fourth quarter of, of 2020. Uh, whereas we, we uh, although we might have we might have some some rebound quarter on quarter recovery in uh, in, in in Q4 in in, lo in, uh, in demand of long products. I mean, compared to the, the, the in the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter, but. It's, it's not as easy to say, to predict, uh, but in any case, we will not be able to, to produce a detailed forecast on, on long products in Q4. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is from Emmanuel Norsa. Uh, for imports, use of the quota has shown that there has been a slowdown in arrivals in the, in the most recent quarter. What do you see in the market? Can this overall data for 2020 negatively in terms of volumes importer, uh, imported? Thank you very much. Well, it might, it might, it might happen. Uh, it might happen. So um, at the end of this year, we might have, uh, we might have a, obviously a, a reduction, a fall in imports, but probably less pronounced that we might expect. But again, we don't, we don't provide forecast for, for imports. Um, we only provide forecasts for apparent and real consumption, but we, we don't we don't quantify um, a detailed forecast for 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 imports. Um, we we monitor very closely imports also on, on a monthly basis, and this is something which is already available in the report. We've seen a, 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 an increase, particularly a pronounced increase for some flat products uh, in in August. But then we have to see what is going to happen over the next uh, over the next few months, um, provided that we don't we the demand seems to be very fragile. The recovering demand may affect negatively imports, um, but it's again it's still it, it's very it's very soon to say that we, it, it's not easy to predict. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now. Uh address Poppy Carnell's question. She's got several, so we'll, we'll do them as they come. Um, and this is related to what you've just mentioned. Practically speaking, is there anything the Commission can now do to address the pandemic um, vis-a-vis -vis the safeguard now? Um, and related to this, if we don't have a deal between the EU and the UK for, for December, are we concerned about the impact? Do we have figures on what this would mean now that we're so close to the fight to the deadline? Thank you. Uh, and the first question, uh, I, I don't know whether there is something which we can actually do. My colleague, uh, Karl Tashley, who is primarily involved with, with his director of, of trade affairs at Eurofair, can provide you with a better answer. Uh, but we, we've tried to, let's say, to address this issue to the Commission um, as much as we could, uh, but there's not much that the Commission can do now in a very short term. Um, yeah, the Commission collects our figures on the impact of a pandemic, which are very serious, and that's th that's the best we can do at the moment. Uh, on, on the second question, yeah, this is another major source of uncertainty, which I haven't mentioned in my presentation, but we have very much uh, clear in our mind Brexit remains a threat because there's uh, there's a high likelihood that we will get at the end of the day we'll get a no deal brexit on 1st january 2021 and, and obviously as eurofair we are very much against uh, a no deal brexit we hope that the uk will remain in the internal market uh, this will be very beneficial for um, steel producers and for consumers uh, for the integrity of the internal market as a whole uh, well, we have no we have no figures on the potential impact. No, uh, even though we are getting prepared for that. Um, but uh, yeah, all we can say is that we 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 very much hope still that there will be an agreement, which we allow we will allow the UK to remain part of the internal market. Thank you very much. There is a question here which I will take. Um, do we? Think, what do we think that this situation will mean for the decarbonisation of the EU steel sector? This is obviously a key issue. The situation regarding 
imports is less affected, is less of an impact directly than this. So we'll move away from the imports issue now. With steel demand in a whole, we face a problem of recovery. Now, the EU has launched its Green Deal, as, um, as we've all noted. And a part of that is to, uh, part of that in the, the ne ne next generation EU, the idea is to launch a green recovery. And we are all for a green recovery per se. The problem is the recovery needs to happen today, whereas any green transition is very much a medium term um, ambition. Ultimately, you, you're, you're talking about moving very far away from current uh, steel technology uh, applications. And over time, this will actually mean abandoning the, the, the way that steel is currently made, at least along the primary route. Uh, so there is an issue related to the ability to invest. Um, this, this coming back to the imports issue, this is where, this is where the problem might lie uh, internationally, is that we are facing steels that on the whole, imported, are more carbon intense than those steels which are produced in Europe. But at the same time, those steels are cheaper and they are based on capacity that's been built up in, in recent years um, and that will undermine the uh, European steel industry's uh, ability to uh, invest for the transition. So there is an effect um, for the global situation uh, on, on the ability to decarbonize um, and it has, it's multifaceted. And if you are interested on, in this issue, I invite you to look at our Green Deal on Steel uh, website, which is uh, part of the UFL website, which explains in more detail our priorities related to the decarbonisation challenge and some of the issues that we believe uh, will come into play as we make the transition towards a 55% reduction in 2030 onwards to an 80 to 95% reduction by 2050. Right, now um, another one from, um, well, no, we'll go to somebody else now. This one is from Ayana Dreyer uh, from Borderlex. What concrete changes would you want to see in the EU steel safeguard? Which countries, uh, which country steel poses the most threat to the industry despite the safeguard? The EU has recently stepped up its trade defense activities in steel. Is this sufficient? Thank you. Now, before I pass to Alessandro, I will point out that the issue with the safeguard was is different some in some ways now than it was at the time of its imposition in 2017 and 18 in that today's market has collapsed but the safeguard is still set at a level well above the level at which it was set which was relative to historical record years 2015 to 17. 18 saw 12, 2018 saw a 12 percent rise over those two those three previous periods and so you, you have uh, the safeguard based on historical level, which is now not likely to be attained. The problem is that as it rolls over, you have the transition, the, 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 um, the, the mechanism that transfers unused quota to the, to the next period. We risk being a situation where when demand does rise again, it, there will be, the safeguard will do nothing to stop it because it simply will be set at a level which allows the quota to be big enough for all imports to come in um, regardless. And, and the point will be that the share of imports as a share of the market will be far larger as a result. Um, and that's the damage as much as anything else. But I'll, I'll I defer to Alessandro for more detail on that. No, I don't have anything to, to add to what you said. Um, I think it's, uh, it's exhaustive. Okay. Um, Okay, now moving on to, I'll go back up to a question on construction permits. That's going to be more detailed. Um, this is from Nuvuyu. Um, on, from a long-term perspective, steel output and demand has been on a decline post the financial crisis, declining from over 210 million tonnes of crude steel to 150 million, million, 158 million tonnes in 2019. Do you see, see the output reaching uh, pre-global financial crisis levels. The urbanization rate in Europe is quite high, as expected for a developed economy. Given that, where do you see growth in demand coming from in the coming years? Thank you. Um, well, as I said, partly in my presentation, we, we expect 
at least over the more the short term, that's to say the next over the next two, three years, we expect the main um, source of growth for construction to be um, represented by um, civil engineering and public construction. Uh, we do not see uh, uh, residential construction and private non-residential as a source of growth, particularly private non-residential appears to be the most affected uh, construction subsector um, uh, as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, the pandemic has slashed really demand for offices and commercial buildings in, in city centers all over Europe uh, these days. Uh, but also despite quite high urbanization rates, um, we do not see residential construction uh, as a source of growth over the next few years. Uh, it is true that uh, on average urbanization rate is high, but then you have to see there are, there are major differences across European countries and even within European countries. Uh, you have a very urbanized areas uh, around capitals and big cities, but then you have a very, very um, a large areas where population density is, is very low. Um, so therefore, and also demographics are not, do not appear to be very favorable uh, in terms of, of, of um, residential demand. So we do, not, we do not expect residential and non-residential to provide a, a strong impetus to construction demand. Whereas, as I said, we expect governments and the EU, and let's say, and also the EU authorities, the commission to push uh, considerably for public construction over the next few years, also as a traditional, let's say, economic tool to boost uh, economic growth. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question, there are a number of questions here which I'm afraid are beyond the scope of this call. Um, I'm afraid we can't talk about ETS uh, allocation in this call. This is not, this is a, this is on the economic and market report, not on the ETS. Um, so I can't address that. I'm afraid we issue the question from Justin Bacaros on construction permits is too specific for this. Um, and on timing on guidance on government support for infrastructure is again beyond our scope. Um, I, there is a question from Poppy again, um, following up on Ilana's question. I understand the issue of the levels, but how, when and how are you asking the Commission to address this? Is there dialogue with the EC on finding a solution? Uh, as it happens, Eurofer has asked, um, and it's hardly a surprise, though it's not exactly been publicly announced, but it's hardly a surprise that we have asked the Commission to uh, to extend the, the, the safeguard as long as is necessary. I want to remind the audience that the Section 232 measures which first justified the imposition of the safeguard are still in, uh, still in effect. So that's not, and they're not going away, and at least until Donald Trump is out of office. It could well be that it's next week, but if he is still in office, or even if do, do, um, Biden does win, he might well retain the measures, in which case the justification for the, section, for the, for the safeguard remains. But what we are asking for, and what we had asked for previously in any case, was that the size of the safeguard reflect the size of the market in which those imports arrive. Because, and it does come back to the levels, despite the, the question, because without levels for safeguards which, def, which are determined on the basis mm -hmm. of the historical share, but are actually relevant to the size of that market, we, the safeguard is not going to be effective. But in addition to that, there are obviously many of the um, changes to the safeguard that we have wished from the off, some of which have, have been implemented, such as having country-specific quotas for certain products, um, for, but issues such as the tra unused transfer quota mechanism have not been addressed, that should be. Um, and as for the uh, as for the automatic, and the same is true of the automatic sizing of the market, which continues apace, despite the fact that the market is obviously a different, much different size to how it was previously. Uh, now that we've answered, there's one more relevant, one or two more relevant ones. Um, so this is from Daniel Palmer. Arguing, arguably, the EU market continues to experience a disconnect between production capabilities, capacities, and declining demand levels, um, not being uh, unrelated to further imports. In this light, could you elaborate on your view on the potential of, for European steel market consolidation and where you see potential opportunities for this uh, 
happening and for capacity to be in, to go offline. Um, can this be? Can this even be addressed um, given the ongoing politicization and state involvement? Um, for example, see ILVA. Now, again, before I pass on to Alessandro, I'd like to say on this point, global overcapacity was before the pandemic, 450 million tons a year. Uh, 300 million tons a year of that was probably in China, according to the OECD. These are very large figures. Global overcapacity is a very major issue, but as a previous speaker pointed out, capacity in the EU has actually been quite sharply reduced in recent years, falling by something like 30 or 40 million tonnes in recent in the last decade. Meanwhile, capacity ab abroad has actually risen, despite there being no economic justification for doing that. And it's that is actually the cause of much of the ruction and friction on the EU market, because even if volumes actually imported are low, offers at the border actually depress prices to the extent where EU manufacturers are having to sell far lower than is necessarily sustainable. Not necessarily dumped, but unsustainable on the EU market. But I'll, I'll leave that to, I'll leave another bit to Alessandro to expand on that. Thanks, Charles. No, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, to say again what you already said. Um, there has been a long, a long term trend in, in, in increasing capacity um, by uh, major uh, competitors, um, let's say steel producers from other parts of the world, uh, primarily China, but not only China. Uh, China, as we, which we've seen in, 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 in recent months, China has already restarted its economy not at full potential, but then as as already is already back on track to to recovery apparently, and mm -hmm. and and its industrial system has started to work again, um, and um, China as well as other uh, as other major um, exporters to the EU has increased their capacity even during the pandemic, and this is something which matters very much, uh, because as I said, once demand will pick up, this will pose some threat to to European steel producers and on their ability to you know, to, to capture the increase in demand and to benefit from that. Um, in relation to um, steel market consolidation, this may at some point become, become reality. Uh, well, obviously the, 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 the steel market is a competitive market, is, a, is, is fully, a, 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 let's say a, a market, is, is part of a market economy. So uh, mergers, acquisitions and consolidations are part of, are part of a game, um, no, no surprise. Um, in terms of government support, we now, as you, you know, we are now entering a revision of the stated guidelines, which are very much important for our sector, which will draw, uh, let's say, with more precision, the, the, the boundaries and, and limits for state aid to, to, to the to steel industry. And in this respect, we will also have to see what uh, what's going to end up with um, let's say, potential purchases of, of uh, state purchases of, of steel industries. On Inva and on other individual companies, I don't want to comment because I'm not allowed to enter, let's say, um, let's say uh, discussions on, on, on the policies that are being carried out by, by our members. So, um, yeah, let's, let's see what happens. And, uh, but I, I don't see any specific issue on this. I mean, we, steel, steel mark, the steel market, the steel industry plays in a market economy. So, this is part of the game. Uh, and one final question. This is from Eric Onstadt from Reuters. Uh, you said COVID led to the worst drop in output on record, but on slide eight, it looks like the impact of the current crisis is less than that of the, G of the great financial crisis in 2009 to 10, with a total decline of 19.7% compared to only 10.4% this time. And the bounce back is already stronger than it was at that time. Um, uh, slide eight. So let me see. So I believe this might be a reference to the period, Eric. I don't know if you're. It, it's yeah. The references is references to is references to Q two. The references to Q2 and the, in Q2 we have experienced the worst drop on record, and we are going to see we're going to see the the let's say uh, the dropping sweep will be 
above 10%, but the, the worst drops uh, in output were recorded over the period, over, over the second quarter. Uh, the impact of a financial crisis has, yes, has been, has been more serious uh, because it has been more widespread across, uh, across daily use sectors. It has affected um, automotive, mechanical engineering, and also domestic appliances more or less uh, to, to a larger extent than, than, than this crisis. But this is something which, as I said, is still subject to, to potential revision and, 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 and a lot of uncertainty. So these numbers may, may, may change, depending very much on what's going to happen in, 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 the, in the third and the fourth quarter. Uh, but we, we might see a rebound, in, we, we will certainly see a rebound in the third quarter, but we might see also um, again, a drop uh, or a, a slowdown, but more, more likely a drop a, a, over the fourth quarter as a result of the new wave of, of a pandemic. Thank you very much. And I think unless there is, uh, for, okay, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. For any follow-up questions related to uh, particularly the CO2 ETS climate policy, I would be happy to address with the, these with the individual speakers if they are so interested. Um, additionally, we will in fact in the future be holding uh, webinars on broader topics of, of, of that Eurofair works on. So if you would like to um, attend those, uh, please let us know and we'll make sure to invite you and there you can address your questions more specifically. Um, but otherwise, in the meantime, I would thank everyone who took the time to listen to us. Um, everyone who has joined the webinar will receive the uh, will receive the presentation uh, and the report and press release will, will be coming out soon as well. And you will also receive those. So um, with no further ado, I'd like to thank my colleague Alessandro for his very clear um, and concise presentation. And again, to everyone who take, has taken the time to join us today. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.